prior to COVID, you know, coming from the advocacy side many years ago, we had a hard time getting landlords to accept, uh, you know, third party payments. And so I, I wonder if, uh, you know, going through the pandemic and, and even though it was kind of the government that's on the hook for the payments, you know, uh, kind of adapting to this third party payment system, if that's gonna, something that's gonna stick with the industry going forward. Um, you know, as, as to whether or not COVID's a disability, that's, that's a, the case law's definitely not clear on that. Uh, and and it's, it's kind of tricky, you know, because we, we can go through the analysis of are they regarded as being a person with a disability or, you know, do they have a substantial limitation of a major life activity? And, and so those are both kind of fact-driven and so it's, it's hard to give probably a, a bright line answer at this juncture. If I can, I wanna actually hop back in. I think Patrick made a really good point and I do think that owners are gonna be more receptive uh, to third party payments moving forward. Again, you know, it's sort of like you see that process. Oh, you know, this isn't so bad, like this is good. And again, you know, at the end of the day, these owners, they're still in the profit making business. And, you know, to the extent too that um, you've got larger, you know, institutional owners, like they have shareholders to report to. And if it's like, well, why are you turning down these profits? Those are hard questions to answer. And so uh, I do think that I'm hopeful that, uh, I feel like I've seen it in my own practice as far as more openness, you know, there's not like the big, uh, you know, uh, uh, federal funds as much coming in now, but still there are like smaller institutions, churches and other community groups that are contributing. And, and I feel like there is more receptiveness to taking those payments than there was before. Now, one of the things I've noticed in representing low-income clients uh, throughout the pandemic has been a real burden on uh, victims of domestic violence. Mm -hmm. uh, we've seen a, a real increase in cases of uh, victims who are unable to leave due to uh, pandemic-related issues. Um, how does the Violence Against Women Act play into fair housing, and are there any uh, updates or, or activities taking place with Bob. Corey, thank you. Yeah, all right. Uh, well, first, actually, before I'm going to get to VAWA, but one thing I want to mention, uh, I feel like there is not as much awareness of VAWA as, frankly, there should be, certainly on the, the ownership side. I feel like uh, I'm frequently educating and providing information about that to owners. And, frankly, once they're made aware of it, I feel like most owners are understand and are happy to comply, but I think that there is a real still lack of awareness, even though, you know, obviously the statute's been on the books for so long. Um, but one of the other things that I also want to mention, too, that I think a lot of owners are not aware of is that there are specific state law rights as far as if you are a victim of stalking, sexual assault, or um, family violence that allow you to terminate your lease. I understand that in some situations, you know, termination of lease may not be the optimal option, but uh, I think if there's more awareness made of that and those statutes, and that's in the, the section of the property code that deals with that, chapter 92, I think 9206 or 016, 920161, and basically they'll allow the residents, and if it's you know, being committed by a co-tenant, that termination's immediate, and, and you know, that immediately releases them from any liability, and at least there's no relenting charges or you know, penalty fees or anything like that that can be charged. And there's teeth there, enforcement, and again, I think just making that awareness and just knowing that, uh, you know, some of these low, lower income folks that may not aware that, be aware that they have these tools. And then also on the other side, just making the ownership aware that like, hey, this is the law, you need to comply with that. When faced with that, again, I find that most landlords are like, oh, I just didn't know. And, and you know, I, I think it's a lot of ignorance that sometimes results in unfortunate outcomes. So that's, that's kind of, I think, where it really comes down to from the ownership perspective, I think, when they're made aware of the issue in the law, they're happy to comply with it. And I, I have a little bit of a different take, I'm from, not necessarily not supportive, but from the regulatory framework, you know, we see these cases as coming in and women are uh, maybe it's a last resort you know, for some folks. And so, but HUD does have some programs we've identified. Uh, Iowa was an issue for uh, across the state of Texas. And we also have, uh, I want to thank HUD as well for providing us with some training and some documentation, some guidelines on trauma-informed communication. So what you're really seeing a lot of times is people that don't have the ability to communicate. There's, there's a strain in communication. 
And that strain in communication uh, basically happened throughout COVID. I think there was a, a, a large level of, as, as one of the persons that was on the phone at TWC when we were getting 20 million phone calls a day, uh, the, the phone systems didn't even work. The, the trunk mm -hmm. systems couldn't even handle it. That, that, that communication that needed to happen was tough. But this is one of the situations where now we need to reach out to an individual that is marginally housed at best. Sometimes they're, they're not employed or they can't find employment or they have kids and other concerns and we really have to take those into concern. Additionally, we also try to make sure that our investigators are up to speed on, on trauma-informed communication. We want to make sure that we're treating them with decency, with respect, and then also understanding that everything that, uh, that they've gone through is going to have an effect on them. So we really want to make sure that we're, uh, the things that we're doing are really helping out that, that, that adversary. Yeah, it's, um, I think VAWA's not even been on the books, but maybe seven, eight months. And so uh, the department's initial response to that was to uh, start a pilot program where everything that had sexual harassment or, or anything of that nature in it, we would run it through a VAWA screening process just to make sure that it wasn't touching on uh, that that standalone statute and so um, programmatically though HUD's had VAWA guidance for years and and what that means is in terms of multifamily properties or uh, public housing properties uh, there's been guidance on the books that kind of mirrors some of what Corey is talking about in terms of what's on the in the state statute in terms of uh, special process uh, you know, allowing tenants to transfer without penalty, allowing them to break their lease if they needed to. Um, so all of those, those things are still there. Uh, but now we have this, this additional statute that applies to federal money recipients. And so we're looking at it through that paradigm in addition to the Fair Housing Act. Now, um, on top of that, something that Brian touched on that, that's really important to us and it's something that we're we're still working on and will continually be working on is, is the communication, uh, communicating with folks that have been through trauma. Um, and, and it's traumatic, not just for the victims, but we're finding that uh, looking at these cases is also traumatic to the staff. And, and because they're seeing terrible things being done to people and, and experiencing it, you know, secondhand or thirdhand but still experiencing it. I mean, people get into this line of work because they care. And so they care and they're feeling all these things. And so we're, we're having to adapt to that as well. So it's been quite an experience. You know, one of the things that I'll bring up is, I'm not gonna go into the details of the investigation, but we do have a matter that's arisen before us that's actually involved both sides of the house where somebody has an employment situation that also impacts their housing situation. And so we really want to be really careful there. We want to make sure that we've, we've tried to coordinate the investigation so that the victim doesn't have to testify twice or try to coordinate their information. We don't have to relive the trauma. Uh, we've also tried to make sure that there's not, you know, they have the most fair shape they can have to bring their case. Because when somebody comes to you and they're at that point of destitution, desolation, isolation, communication is not really even within their sphere of thinking. So we really have to be very, very sensitive there. Now, I uh, want to remind everyone we're going to have time for questions at the end, so please uh, take notes and come up with some good questions. I see a lot of people in the audience that I know, and you can expect to be called on if there are no other <laughs> questions. So they, they are attorneys, so they will be used to being called on in class, okay? Um, now, one of the things that's closely related to uh, domestic abuse, domestic violence, is sort of the mental health issue and, and the mental health crisis that we're facing. Um, how does that relate to the, the Fair Housing Act? And I know prior to this panel, we discussed emotional support animals and the number of cases relating to uh, emotional support animals. Corey? Yeah, no, with, uh, you know, it, it's so easy. Uh, you know, we, we were, I think Brian and, and Patrick both touched on, you know, emotional trauma and an ability to communicate after you have that. And I think it's so easy for us to forget about things that we don't see. You know, uh, there's so much uh, that our other instances can tell us that we can kind of pick up on, but somehow it just seems like we're always falling back on just our eyes. And that's the only thing we're, we're using to interact with and see the world. 
And so as a result of that, uh, I think that a lot of times, and this is particularly for the, the housing context and ownership, is that they're just not thinking about, oh, somebody may not have a cane or somebody may not be in a wheelchair, but they can still be disabled. And so again, there's just so much there that needs to be done with like education and awareness and like having groups and symposiums like this I think is incredibly helpful to having those conversations and making sure that there's awareness that those accommodations need to be made and that you know as long as there's a proper disability under the Fair Housing Act and you know documentation as, as allowed is provided then I think making sure that uh, housing uh, providers are aware that they need to make those accommodations and again, you know, I, I said this in my, my earlier comments, and I'll say it again here. When, when told that, like, this is the law, I do find that almost always, you know, nobody's going to be like, oh, well, pfft, law doesn't apply to me. Like, that, that's not the perspective that you're going to take, and especially, too, when you've got these larger institutional owners who are sensitive to the idea of, you know, uh, making sure that they're not violating the law and that they're not going to be cast in a bad light. And so, you know... While obviously like corporate ownership of housing has its downsides and they are numerous, uh, I think some of the upside there is being more sensitive and more concerned about making sure that there's compliance with the law because of the negative impact and because that they do report to like, you know, back to those shareholders and those other people in the uh, larger community. I'm gonna say something that I don't think is a surprise. I think probably most people have heard it before, but you know, Americans are some of the loneliest people in the world. Out of the 375 or 380 million people, um, they're lonely in many cases. About 60% of our cases actually involve a disability. So, you know, considering that we have about 400, I think this year we'll hit near 425 substantive actual determinations, and then there's many thousands of, or hundreds of inquiries beyond that. Um, that happens on both sides of our house, whether that's an employment case or even housing. So we're talking about thousands upon people that literally they feel destitute in some way. So we, uh, before I became the, the director for the Civil Rights Division, I'd never heard of ESA. I had to go figure out what the world was an emotional support animal. And I suspect that for a lot of the fair housing providers that they had to go and, and do a little study and get up to speed on what is emotional support animal? Why do they need an emotional support animal? What are the standards for when you can grant that reasonable accommodation? And so what we really try to do is to make sure that um, because in some ways we have, I think our, our numbers, I think we've talked about earlier, that our numbers have basically doubled since the pandemic. So we've gone through this collective emotional traumatic event as, as a nation. And as we've gone through that, there's, there's some damage, there's some harm, there's things that we have to fix, there's some things that need to be palliative. But as we've gone through that process, we've also had to try to educate folks. And we, we're, we're, we're always constantly in a struggle, and I think it's no surprise, that we have a very limited number of resources, but we have a large amount of demand. So what we've tried to focus on is making sure we're providing that technical assistance, that education to those that actually can make a difference right now. We don't want to fix the problems later. We want to fix the problems before they ever occur. Yeah, much like uh, TWC, about 65% of our workload is disability-based workload, and then that's followed by race as our next largest uh, group of complainants. And so, um, you know, with respect to even, you know, the VAWA or even just disabilities in, in general, I think uh, communication is important. Uh, understanding that you can't communicate with everybody the same way is important. Uh, we, we deal with a lot of individuals who have uh, serious mental health issues. Uh, they don't necessarily trust the government, even though they come to us for help. And so that presents challenges in and of itself as well. And, um, you know, we, it's, you know, it's tough, and, you know, and I, I, I commend somebody like Corey who's, who's navigating these on a daily basis and, and, you know, encouraging his clients to do the right thing. Um, the, the job is tough because there's, you know, like I said earlier, there's just not these bright lines that we can work off of. You know, there is guidance and there is, you know, there's developing case law. Uh, but, you know, those things continue to evolve. And so, um, you know, in terms of the department, over the last, uh, over the last year we've had a couple of uh, 
probably important cases come through. Uh, one that we ended up issuing a uh, letter of finding and then ultimately a letter of determination on, which is a Section 504 of the Rehab Act process. Um, it was against the Dallas Housing Authority and ultimately we settled that complaint, but it was a failure to accommodate case. Um, and, you know, just the, the lack of action by the housing authority uh, to, to address this lady's needs uh, subjected her to months of, of humiliation, uh, isolation. There, you know, there were strong, long, long stretches where she, you know, was stuck in a second floor apartment that she couldn't get out of because she was now in a wheelchair after being in an accident and the housing authority would not move her. And so, you know, ultimately the, the case settled for about a half million dollars. And, you know, for her, it's, it's a transformative experience, right? She's, you know, no longer a participant in the housing program. She's buying a home. It's a great story for her, but, you know, getting there had to be just miserable. And, and you know, but, but those type of cases do send a message, you know, it's, the, the housing authority has been much more, you know, but of course it costs them to get there, but you know, they've been much more responsive, they're kind of on top of it. And so those, those type of things do impact the industry as well. And I'll pose this follow-up question to, to anybody who wants to jump in, but with regard to the emotional support animals and documenting the need for one, I think one of the things we've seen at the city uh, is these suspected paper mills, right? Mm -hmm. um, so how do you all deal with that in terms of your practice? I'll, I'll jump anybody in. Anybody who wants to <laughs> I'll go. <laughs> Sure, so in order to, ha to have the accommodation for an emotional support animal, you need a doctor's note. And so s there are suspected online doctors, small air quotes, um, who just will provide a note, uh, a paper, you know, paper mill basically providing notes. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in. <laughs> <laughs> We've got some pretty colorful stories. Um, yeah, so in terms of the Fair Housing Act, you know, a person has the right to request a reasonable accommodation. It, in terms of the guidance, there's kind of these three tiers of inquiry. You know, if you look at the individual and you don't question that they have a disability and you don't question that they have a need, you should grant it. Um, the second tier is if you don't question the disability, but maybe you question the, the need or the effectiveness of the accommodation, then you can request documentation limited to confirming that there is a need or benefit for this accommodation. And then once you reach that threshold where you feel like, okay, I've answered that question, and it's a reasonable person standard. Um, you know, then you stop. And then the third one is the really hard one where you question whether or not they have a disability and you question whether or not they have the need for it. And so then at that point, a lot of times we see the doctor's notes with respect to kind of the level two or the level three of the inquiry where they're questioning either both disability and need or, or definitely the need for that animal. And so, um, you know, the internet's an amazing thing. You can Google support animals and there's people that are out there that will send you a certificate, they will uh, send you a vest or whatever else, and um, some of them will talk to you once, and then, you know, they'll write you a letter, and, and then, you know, supposedly you're golden. Um, the, the challenge that we're finding is that some of our complainants have doctors, but their doctors have a policy of not writing those letters but they have a need. So then what's happening is we're finding some of our complainants use the online services to fill a gap in the need that they have. And then we also have, you know, unfortunately, we also have the folks who are trying to get out of paying, you know, a pet deposit or pet rent. And so they just, they, they pass go and immediately, you know, jump over to getting the online letter. And, you know, so that's, where Brian 
and I, our, our agencies would be tasked with kind of sorting out, did the person actually have a disability? Did they actually have that need? And then in terms of uh, what Corey's clients are, are saddled with, is trying to navigate those kind of questions through an interactive process where they have no authority to force somebody to, to produce that stuff. And so a lot of times the, the client or their customer, which would be our client, would not be willing to hand over medical records to somebody that works in an office. And so a lot of times there's like a release form or something like that. Occasionally they'll sign them, sometimes they don't. I think from where we sit, a, a big problem we have is some landlords will not even bother to try and verify on their own. I'd say that I'd confirm all that, that there's a miry bog of uh, soup uh, when we go through this process. It, it's, you know, and and we're, we certainly want to be attentive and, and sensitive to those that have a need. There's some people that, like, like Patrick said, they have a need, they go see their doctor, and the doctor says, go see somebody else. And they don't realize it's a paper mill. So they come to us earnestly with the, the paperwork they think that will, will provide the, re the resolution they need. Others, there may be some that, that aren't such honest, honest brokers. And so we have to go through and sort of divine that, that, that nature of what we're trying to do. One of the things I think we, we've done fairly well um, as an agency is we've put out you know, some documentation that's fairly clear and, and uh, try to assist those, those providers, uh, home, housing providers, with the guidance in terms of what are the standards for an emotional support animal? What's the difference between a, a service animal? When is the, the not, no required? And, and what types of things we can ask for in terms of documentation? Um, we see that education is really the, the best way forward here. We're really trying to get out of the situation of trying to investigate all the occurrences. There's very, a, a whole lot of different, uh, different scenarios. And, and I think, you know, Neil, you talked about it. That, uh, I think we talked about it before in a, beforehand, that communication is really where a lot of this stuff stems from that there's really the 99% of the time, most of the times, most of the issues are everybody's very hunky-dory. Mm -hmm. But then there's the 1% where nobody actually actually communicates. Nobody ever asks, well, do you really have an issue? Do you need a, a reasonable accommodation? And can we get the documentation for that, to provide that reasonable accommodation? Those are where the issues come up, and that's when we have to get involved. Yeah, and, and I think coming at it again from like the owner perspective, the frustration is when you know somebody gets something from a website uh, there's there's emotional support supportpets.com certa pet that sort of thing and and what you can do with these websites is you'll go on there and there'll be five very vaguely worded questions like did you feel a little you know w was it a little sad today <laughs> you know like basically the kinds of like questions that like I think Absolutely. I could answer yes to every day and and you know I'm doing okay so you know it that that's the problem and then my clients get these these letters from these people from these uh, well, I mean, they, they, they usually, sometimes they'll even contract with somebody. Sometimes, you know, the, the obvious ones are where it's like, this dog is certified as an emotional support animal. And it's like, well, is it? Like, what, what did you do to certify that? Like, no, these certificates are obvious. But what's a little trickier for my clients to really navigate is more and more some of these mills and these on-site online websites. And basically the problem is they're not actually speaking with or helping the people that are filling out this information, they're not helping them with their disabilities. It's not like their counsels, counselors are actually engaging with them to know even if they really have an issue or not. And so they have like pre-populated forms where it'll just say, you know, so-and-so is, you know, I've examined so-and-so and they're disabled under the Fair Housing Act and maybe Section 504, sometimes they'll quote as well. And, you know, they meet the functional limitations. And then when those things aren't branded with those pet web service websites, that's when it gets really tricky from my, my client's perspective. Is like, well, okay, this says this, but what's amazing is sometimes you'll get the exact same form letter. Maybe it's even from a, got a different doctor name slapped up on there or counselor name slapped up on there. And what you go back and if you kind of like search the text for that, what you find and it trace back, it's all being routed through this one mill website where somebody's paying 100 bucks and then it's just cranking out this letter for them. And, and dealing with that, that is the frustration for my clients because where the whole idea of the concept of like pet fees and extra pet charges are, are that the concern for the owner is that having an animal is just gonna do a little more damage to the apartment while during their tenancy. You know, uh, pets are great and you know, they're, they're wonderful companions and they do a lot of great things for everybody. But you know, 
uh, a Pyrenees is going to do some more damage to that carpeting than, you know, just not having them. And so that's the, the push-pull there, I think, that uh, comes back and, and why, you know, y when you get, I think from the ownership side, what you end up having is that they get super frustrated by these people that, you know, are going to these websites and producing, you know, marginal or questionable requests and then trying to differentiate those from the ones that are legitimate where somebody like, no, really, you know, this cat helps me to like get out of bed every day because if, if Fluffy weren't here, I would just lay there and just not be able to move. And, and you know, obviously those are the kinds of things that we want to grant, but it's just that vetting and that's just really hard. So uh, let's move from the current issues to the legal update portion of the panel discussion. Um, what are the state and federal cases and legislation that you all are keeping an eye on and that advocates in the room should be aware of? I, uh, the, the, f the first one that comes to mind for me is uh, HUD just announced, well, just maybe, I think it was last month, uh, that they are reinstating the 2013 disparate impact rules. For those of you not aware, uh, basically under the Fair Housing Act, if a policy or practice that is otherwise neutral on its face has a disparate impact on protected classes, that's discrimination and that's actionable under the Fair Housing Act. Um, and basically during uh, the Obama administration, there were rules that were implemented to sort of, you know, basically guidance from HUD. It's sort of a three-part burden shifting. I like to think of it like tennis. I'm a big closet tennis fan. And so basically what you have is you have the person, you know, who will, the, the complainant who will say, you know, hey, your policy, has a discriminatory effect on me. And so they kind of volley that serve over the net. So then it comes to the housing provider to say, no, 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 I have a substantial legitimate business reason for whatever my policy or practice is. Like, you know, I require this level of, of income for, for my applicants or a uh, hot button issue, I don't take vouchers at my property. And so then that's them volleying it back because, you know, I'm saying, oh, and then it comes back to the, the complainant to then serve back and say, no, 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 you're really, this is a pretext. That's not really the reason. That's not, this still is designed to, you know, subtly discriminate against me. And that's the push-pull, and that was the framework that everybody understood. And then there was the Inclusive uh, Communities Project case that came out, I think, actually there were two of them. Uh, it ran here through Texas. That's a, uh, I don't know what they are, an advocate group uh, up in the DFW area. And basically they said that, uh, you know, the denial of vouchers and that sort of thing was, uh, discrimination and so then that went up to the Fifth Circuit and that went up to the Supreme Court and they were looking at wrestling with this and so then that came back down so then after that happened that was 2015 then HUD issued new guidance and rules and I believe it was 2020 those were theoretically taking into account some of the issues that were grappled with the Supreme Court in connection with the inclusive community project uh, litigation and they basically were found to have gone way too far the other way to say like, no, you know, housing, or, you know, housing developers, providers have a lot more deference on this than before. And so there's litigation on that. Those rules never even went into effect. And so now, just I believe last month, HUD announced that they're going back, back to the future, for uh, this, uh, the 2013 guidance. And so that's, you know, this three-part burden shifting, you know, that I very vaguely and very loosely just discussed with you. Um, you know, is kind of back in effect, and I believe they're saying that's going to take place. I think that takes effect beginning of next month is the plan. So that's probably, in my mind, the biggest thing. Um, actually, I will say something. Ms. Jackman had mentioned earlier uh, in her thing, talking about issues with voucher bans. There is legislation in front of the Texas House, House Bill 1193, that would prohibit uh, bans on vouchers by HOAs. That was related to the issue. There was a HOA up in Denton that uh, was trying to ban vouchers. And uh, anyway, I, I don't know that that legislation has real legs, but it's out there. So to the extent you want to kind of push for that, contact your rep, contact your senator. House Bill 1193, or yeah, 1193 is the one that you want to advocate for. Uh, and I'm going to abstain from commenting on the, any legislation that's presently before the state legislature. Uh, Smart man. What I would say, though, is I think there's still some interesting law to be developed. Uh, one of the cases that we're, we're still Obviously, most of us are keenly watching is the Bostock and the Bostock versus Clayton County, uh, Georgia. Um, that matter has gone to the Fifth Circuit. They are looking at it for some religious carve outs. Uh, one of the issues we're also looking at is um, there's some interpretation with regard to whether that Title VII application should then be converted over to Title VIII and, and fall into fair housing. The, the, the 
issue of sex or the broadening of the definition of sex should be applied in the fair housing context. So that's something we're interested in and certainly following. And Brian, could you just explain what the Bostock case was? I mean, in, in <laughs> short, it's, it's what Bostock basically said was that sex beyond was not just the, the male gender, that it actually involved a, um, the larger connotation of gender, uh, gender identity and um, those that were transgender and other, and other uh, backgrounds. I'll say that way. That's kind of what Bostock did. It expanded the definition of sex. It didn't add another class, but it did expand that definition and then applied that for the Title VII matters, which are employment cases. Um, I think that was the case with the, it was consolidated with several different cases. I think mm -hmm. one was with the cake, whether or not somebody could for, be forced to make a cake for uh, somebody that was uh, transgender cake for somebody that, that was a Christian. Um, and I'm not sure I've got the details right. I think it was like three or four cases there. So, But that's basically what the, the issue is, is when we do expand that definition of sex, will that definition of sex, which includes expanded gender identity and orientation, will that be also be extended over into the fair housing context? I'll say HUD's already kind of jumped in on that debate and expanded it under the federal statute to, to include what kind of what we put under our LGBTQ guidance. And so uh, we took that Title VII approach, which is the employment perspective, and and applied it to housing. Um, it's a matter of history. The, the Fair Housing Act is built off of the Title VII paradigm anyway. Um, so it was just kind of a natural transition for us. Um, to get back to what Brian was, was speaking about initially in, in terms of disparate impact, uh, we, we did renew the rule and it will go into effect sometime this year. Um, there's, also, it, it kind of interrelated to the disparate impact issues are, are these uh, cases that we have involving source of payment or source of income. Um, we, we've actually got several big cases up in the DFW area involving large uh, uh, property owner associations that have, uh, and we're talking thousands of single family homes in some of these communities that have uh, basically banned accepting Section 8 as a form of payment, uh, basically not allowing a renter to rent in their neighborhood if they have a Section 8 voucher. And so we're looking at those under uh, disparate impact theory and going through a lot of the things that, that Brian talked about in terms of kind of this tennis match, the back and forth, you know, was there a legitimate business reason? Is there a less discriminatory approach that they could have taken and then um, unfortunately for one of the cases uh, though it's got disparate impact implications we we've got a lot of evidence that we've gathered through like social media and, and things like that that would suggest intent um, you know everything from uh, offensive memes being shared by board members to you know statements that that are you know it, a, a reasonable person would believe that those are discriminatory as well. So we, we have these cases that are maybe hybrids as well. Um, the other thing that the department has uh, kind of amped, uh, uh, ramped up a little bit this year is we're uh, looking at criminal history again. Uh, there was recently a, a statement put out by uh, Marsha Fudge, Secretary Fudge, and uh, so our emphasis kind of back to the Obama administration's initial push to look at that and, and to examine the disparate impact that that has on potential renters. And so uh, you'll probably, uh, within you know, over the next 12 months, probably see HUD uh, being much more assertive on that issue and there will certainly be cases that, that do come down where we're, we're looking at folks that have been, you know, automatically banned because they had a, you know, a misdemeanor or a felony and, you know, and I'll just make it extreme because we've seen the extreme, uh, you know, a felony that was 20 years ago and this, this individual has gone on to just be, you know, a regular person like everybody else, right? You know, working a job, kids, family, all that bit and then to not be able to rent for something that they did when they were a kid is just uh, is absurd, but because of the mis uh, the overrepresentation 
due to contact with law enforcement, uh, these, these policies disproportionately impact communities of color. So um, that's all I'll say. Okay. Neil, can I ask a follow-up that Patrick sure. yeah. maybe can't answer? Sure. Okay. Oh, Patrick, so I, the, on, on that particular issue, the 2016 uh, memo from the, the HUD General Counsel is like, as far as I know, the last, the best guidance we have for criminal history review stuff. Is, is there going to be new or supplemental guidance that might be coming out to, to address more of this? Or is this just we're really uh, cracking down and, and making sure we're enforcing that existing guidance? I anticipate new guidance. Okay. Thank you. And the so answer. <laughs>